Hi there, and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2, Tutorial 18. This tutorial focuses on calculating earnings per share, or EPS. This tutorial has seven learning objectives. The first will be to demonstrate how to calculate the weighted average common shares, or WACs as sometimes we like to call it, or WACS. Second, to calculate the earnings available to common shareholders for the purposes of calculating basic EPS. Third, we'll illustrate how to calculate basic EPS. Fourth, we will assess the individual impacts of potentially dilutive instruments, including warrants, options, convertible preferred shares, and convertible bonds. The fifth objective will be to rank potentially dilutive items for an inclusion into diluted EPS calculations. Sixth, we'll calculate diluted EPS. And seven, we'll show proper income statement disclosure of basic and diluted earnings per share. This tutorial is based on the Simpson Inc. example. There is one basic requirement for this, and that's to compute all earnings per share figures that should be disclosed by Simpson on its December 31st, 2021 financial statements. Just indicating that we need to calculate all the EPS figures means we're going to have to do all of the things that we identified in the learning objectives. All right, the first step we need to do is calculate the weighted average common shares. So how do we do that? Well. There are some different ways you can do it, but uh, the way I'm going to show is probably the easiest for most students to follow. It looks a little daunting at first, but when we get through this larger table, I'll show you a shortcut. So what we have here is a table showing the sequence of events, the series of dates that that happens on. Okay, you'll see why this is important. The description of what happens, the number of shares outstanding, a column for the retroactive restatement factor that relates to splits and stock dividends. We'll talk about that. The fraction of a year that the shares are outstanding, and then we'll get the weighted average. The first event is really just the opening balance. It's not really an event. What this means is that nothing happened from the period of January 1st to March 31st. The first time something happens is on April 1st. So that means we have this period of time where 336,000 shares is the only number of shares outstanding. This is given. Then we're told at two different points in the problem, a couple of things happen. The first, that there's a stock split. There's a two for one split. And then there's a 10% stock dividend. What we have to do is take the number of shares, multiply by two, times 1.1, right? So we double it for the stock split. We multiply it by 1.1 or add another 10% for the stock dividend. And then we multiply by the fraction of the year. So three over 12. So all of these, the shares outstanding times the restatement factors times the fraction of the year equals the weighted average common shares. Effectively, the opening balance adjusted for the split in the stock dividend, outstanding for three of 12 months inclusive, right? Because January, February, and March is three months. That gives us 184,800. Then the next time something happens here is on April 1st. The company issues an additional 20,000 shares. What that means is that at this point, there are 356,000 shares outstanding, pre-split and pre-dividend calculated as the original 336 plus this additional 20,000 here. And because this is before the split in the dividend, we have to adjust for those factors. So times 2.2 times 1.1, and then times another three of 12 months because April, May, and June inclusive is three months. So that's 195,800. The next event happens on July 1st. This is where we have the two for one stock split. So at this point, you see how we doubled up the number of shares now from 356 times two to 712,000 shares. But look here, when we have the retroactive restatement factor, we're no longer including the two because it's included over here. So the only thing that we have to worry about is the stock dividend, which comes later on. So we have to multiply this only by the future stock dividend of 10% or times 1.1 and then multiply by one over 12 months because this number of shares is outstanding only for July. That gives us 65,267 shares. The next event happens on August 1st. This is where that stock dividend happens. So when we take the 712,000 shares and multiply by 1.1, or it's the same thing as saying 712,000 times 10%, is 71,200 and adding that to 712 
that's where we get 1.1, we end up with 783,200. And then notice now that there is no more retroactive restatement factor to consider. All periods pre-split and pre-dividend have to be adjusted for those events. The fraction of the year is two months because August 1st to September 30th is two months inclusive. So multiply by two over 12 gives us 130,533 shares. Then the last one is retirement. On October 1st, the company retired 5,000 shares. So if we take the 783,200, take off 5,000 shares, we would be left with 778,200 shares. Again, no retroactive restatement factor. And that number of shares is outstanding for three out of 12 months, October, November, and December inclusive, gives us 194,550. When we add them all up, the total weighted average number of common shares is 770,950 shares. And when we add up all the fractional months, we should end up with 12 out of 12, and we do. So that's how you do weighted average common shares. Now, again, if the table looks daunting, here's a shortcut. This has all the information that you would have in the table, with the only exception being that we didn't use a table to prepare it. Starting from the very beginning, you see we've got 336,000 shares times 2 times 1.1 times 3 over 12 is 184,800. And then you follow that all the way through. So it's not necessary that you create a table. Once you understand what's happening in the table, then you should be able to end up taking the shortcut and just make sure that you're calculating, including the fractional weights as they're supposed to be. Because you see here, you see all of these periods have the, the retroactive restatement factors applied. So we can tell that this is where the split happened. And then we can tell that because the stock dividend isn't here anymore, we know that this is where the stock dividend happened. This is just a shorter version of the larger green table, and we get to the same result. Next up, calculating the basic EPS. We'll do this in sort of steps two and three. So we calculate the earnings for the basic EPS and then the basic EPS itself. So what we do is we start with our net income. Then what we do is look to see if there are any discontinued operations. In the problem, there is discontinued operations. And if you refer to the data, that there is a loss on discontinued operations of 125,000. What we have to do is add back the loss on the discontinued operation, because what we want for EPS is earnings before discontinued operations, or basically from continuing operations. If there was a gain on discontinued operations, then we would subtract it, of course. Then we always have to deduct any dividend entitlements on cumulative Class B preferred shares. There are two classes of preferred shares. Class A is non-cumulative. Class B is cumulative. Because Class A is non-cumulative and no dividend was declared, we don't have to include anything here. In this case, Class B is cumulative and it doesn't matter if there are dividends in arrears. A common mistake students use is that they try to include dividends in arrears. Current only. We have 10,000 preferred shares that pay a $3 dividend, so we subtract the dividend entitlement of $30,000, giving us earnings available for basic EPS on our continuing operations of $1,325,000. The next part's easy. We have already calculated the weighted average common shares, 770,950. So the basic EPS is simply the earnings divided by the number of common shares. If we want our basic EPS, we'll take $1,325,000 and divide by 770,950. That gives us $1.72 EPS on the continued operations. Then if we want to uh, determine what the impact of the discontinued operations is, basically we'll take the loss right, of 125,000 divide by 770,950, which means that there's a 16 cent per share loss on the discontinued operations. And when we do the math, we end up with basic EPS on net income of $1.56. And we can prove that $1.56 as taking the net income, subtracting the preferred share dividends, and then dividing by 770,950 shares. That gives us $1.56. So you should be able to confirm by way of math vertically and then be able to prove mathematically the uh, final basic EPS on net income.
Now we'll start the fourth step, which is to determine the individual impacts of each of the potentially dilutive elements. It doesn't matter what order you start with, but we'll start with the preferred shares. You can start with any of them first, as long as you capture them all, because the ranking will come uh, in the next step. What we are going to look at first are the individual impacts from the, and this should say non-cumulative, Class A convertible common shares. Okay, so this class is non-cumulative. There's a typo here. To determine the individual impact of something, we look at what the savings is or the impact on the earnings is and the impact on the number of shares. Because this is a non-cumulative preferred share, unless dividends are actually declared, there is no dividend, right? And so there's no impact on the earnings. So there's no Class A preferred dividend declared in this case. However, the preferred shares are convertible, each preferred share, into two common shares. There are 4,000 preferred shares, and each is convertible into two common shares, which means that this would result in 8,000 shares being issued. Now, what we do is determine the net impact on a per share basis by taking one divided by the other. And of course, if we take zero divided by 8,000, the impact is zero. However, what this will do is result in an increase in shares. Even though there's no earnings impact, this is automatically dilutive because an additional 8,000 shares would be included. Then we look at the impact on the Class B cumulative preferred share. In the case of a cumulative preferred share, a dividend does not have to be declared. Whether or not the dividend declared is irrelevant. But what we have here is 10,000 Class B convertible preferred shares that pay a $3 dividend. And what we do in the individual impact is consider one year only, current year only. That's important because a lot of students like to include dividends in arrears. Dividends in arrears are irrelevant. Now, just like the Class A convertible preferred shares, each preferred share is convertible into two common shares. That means there's an additional 20,000 shares that would be issued. So the net impact on a per share basis is $30,000 in earnings with an additional 20,000 shares issued. So the impact is $1.50. Now what we do to determine whether or not to include that preferred share is we look at the outcome and we compare it to the basic EPS of $1.72. As long as this is less than $1.72, then we include it. Anything greater than $1.72 would be anti-dilutive. In this case, we would include both the Class A preferred shares with no dollar impact, but including it because it will automatically result in dilution of common shares, and we'll include the Class B preferreds because its per share individual impact is less than the basic EPS. The next item we'll look at are the convertible bonds. In terms of impact on earnings, there's a million dollars in bonds that bear 9% interest. That means the interest on these bonds would be $90,000. But what we must do is multiply by the after-tax rate. So if the tax rate is 40%, we then multiply by one minus the tax rate to give us 60% after tax. So $90,000 times 60% is $54,000. That's the savings of interest if the bonds were converted. And then if the bonds were converted, there's a million dollars in bonds, each bond is worth $1,000, so we have to take the million, divide it by 1,000 to tell us how many bonds there are, and each bond is convertible into 40 common shares. That's how we end up with an additional 40,000 shares. So the individual impact of converting the bonds is $1.35. That $1.35 is less than 172 basic EPS, so we will also include this in our diluted EPS calculations. Finally, we'll look at the remaining items, like warrants and options. They could also include stock rights. They're all treated the same way. In this case, the owner of the warrant can purchase a stock at $62 per share. We call that the strike price or the exercise price. But we have to be careful to say, hey, look at this. The $62 strike price is more than the average market price. Well, you'd have to be pretty crazy to pay $62 for something that's only worth $60. So we would assume that a reasonable investor would not take this deal and therefore would not exercise their warrants. Therefore, they're considered to be anti-dilutive, so we do not include them. That leaves us with the options. 
Now the options have a $20 strike price. So the investor can exercise their options and pay $20 for a stock that's worth $60. Well, that's a pretty good deal. So automatically it's dilutive. So it's going to be included. The catch is, well, what is the impact on shares? When it comes to warrants and options, there is no dollar impact or earnings impact. It's only in the number of shares. They're always dilutive in the number of shares. So what we do is we say, okay, if the options are exercised, this would result in an increase of 30,000 shares. A number of students stop here, but here's the catch. What we must do is use something called the treasury stock method, also called sometimes you might see the free shares approach, that assumes the company will take the money that it gets from the exercise of the options and buy back its own shares in the market. If the option holders exercise their 30,000 options, they'll pay $20 a share, and then they will take that money, that's $60,000, and they will go on the market, the company will pay $60 a share to repurchase its own shares. What this does basically is it limits the dilution, whereas if a company wants to limit the amount of dilution that exists, it'll take the money from the shares that are issued with options. And it's the same with warrants. If the warrants are exercised or if share rights are exercised, they're all the same. The company is assumed to go take that money right away on the uh, stock market and purchase its own shares. So this result in a buyback of 10,000 shares, resulting in an incremental number of shares that are potentially issued of 20,000 shares. This is very, very important. Make sure that you capture this when you're doing any problems. The next step is to rank them. What I'm going to do is bring up all of the items that we just evaluated. Remember, we have the non, these are non-cumulative. Class A preferred shares, which we said include. We had the Class B convertible preferred shares, which we must also include. The convertible bonds, $1.35 less than $1.72 include. The options, as long as the strike price is less than the exercise price, it's automatically going to be included. But the question is, in what order? What happens is, we start ranking. Options, rights, and warrants are always number one. These are always first, because there's no earnings impact and only a share impact. Now, in the case of preferred shares, anything that has a share impact, we're increasing the number of shares, but no dollar impact would also be included. You see why they're both ranked number one is because they both are dilutive. Not that they're equally dilutive, but they both automatically increase the number of shares with no earnings. In terms of the order that they go in the diluted calculations, it doesn't matter which one you sort of put in first and second but basically they are ranked number one, they're tied. Then we start looking at the impact from the lowest to highest. You see on the per share, the whole point of doing the individual impacts is to determine A, are they gonna be included or excluded? So dilutive or anti-dilutive if they're excluded, and then the ranking. So the $1.35 is the lowest item we rank from lowest to highest. So $1.35 is ranked second, and then, of course, the last one is the preferred share, the Class B, with a $1.50 impact. This is the order we're going to include them in the next piece, which is our diluted EPS calculations. Now we'll do the last two steps, which is going to be to calculate the diluted EPS and then show what the presentation is going to look like. We always start with basic EPS. We calculated this before. There's nothing new. We have two columns. One column for the earnings impact, that's going to be the numerator, and one column for the number of shares. And so when we take one and divide by the other, we end up with the EPS. From the EPS that we calculated on continuing earnings, we had $1,325,000 and 770,950 shares, giving us $1.72 to start. Great. Now, we bring in our number one ranked item. We can bring in the options first, or you could bring in the preferred shares. This doesn't matter, but we'll bring in the options. There is no dollar impact on options, and there is a net 20,000 shares that are issued. Remember, that's from 30,000 issued on the exercise minus the 10,000 repurchased. Also tied for number one were the Class A preferred shares. Again, you see there's no dollar impact, but 8,000 shares. What's going to happen here is we create a subtotal. 
our earnings impact is still a million three twenty five, but now we have a subtotal number of shares seven hundred and ninety eight thousand nine fifty. And you notice here that we end up with an interim, this divided by this equals $1.66. Our EPS has dropped from 172 to 166. This proves the dilution. The earnings available to the common shareholders will drop as the number of shares increases. So then we go to the next ranked item. We said that the number two ranked item was the convertible bonds. We add in the dollar impact and the share impact as previously calculated in the individual impacts. We can't stress enough the importance of doing the individual impacts because it provides you with all the numbers necessary to do the diluted EPS calculation, but also the ranking. This part is actually pretty easy once you see the process. We add $54,000 and 40,000 shares. We create a new subtotal. Every time you add in a dilutive item, we have to create a subtotal. So now we're at $1,379,000 divided by 838,950 shares gives us a buck 64. See, it's diluted again, right? We can tell here that as long as the EPS drops, we know we're doing it right. If you ever see the EPS increase, that means the item you're including is anti-dilutive or you've done something wrong with the calculation. The last item we'll put in is the third ranked preferred shares. Those will result in additional $30,000 and an additional 20,000 shares. 10,000 preferred shares convertible into two common shares. So that's where 20,000 shares comes from. Our next and final total is $1,409,000 and 858,950 shares. Now this also works out to be $1.64. We're only showing to two digits here, so this would be lower when you factor the number of digits, but when we're adding $30,000 to a million and adding 20,000 shares, the impact is actually negligible. That's it for the calculation of the diluted EPS. The last piece we would do is show what the presentation should be on the income statement. If there were no discontinued operations, then the continuing operations and the net income would be the same number. So all you would see on an income statement would be this line here. But because we have continued operations and discontinued operations, we must disclose separately. The advantage to doing all these calculations on continuing operations just kind of makes it a bit easy. But we have continuing operations, that's the same number that this is here, a buck 72, and the diluted EPS on continuing operations is $1.64. The discontinued operations takes the $125,000 loss and divides by the number of shares. So that's 16 cents. And if we take the same 125,000 divided by 858,950, that works out to 15 cents. And if we take 172 minus 16, we get $1.56, and 164 minus $1.15 is $1.49. And if we were to take our net income and do the calculations, basically taking the 1409 and subtracting the 125,000 in a discontinued operations, and then dividing by 858,900, we would get this number as well. And the proof for it is shown in the red box. Okay, so now let's finish up with our key points to remember. There are five key steps in determining EPS calculations. The first thing you must do is calculate the weighted average number of common shares. That's a fairly detailed calculation sometimes, so make sure that you're comfortable with those. Then calculate the earnings for the basic EPS, and that's where we start with our net income. If we have discontinued operations, we will add back any losses or subtract any uh, gains. And then we will subtract any preferred share dividends. Remember, if the preferred shares are cumulative, then only current year dividends. If the preferred shares are non-cumulative and no dividend is declared, then we don't include those dividends. Then we would calculate the basic EPS, taking that earnings available divided by the weighted average common shares. This is an easy piece. Then the individual impacts, and I can't stress enough how often students don't calculate the individual impacts. And so we have to look at the increased dollar earnings divided by the number of additional shares. 
we'll rank them starting with the share only impacts the items that are like options rights or warrants or non-cumulative preferred shares or no dividend is issued and then items with the lowest to highest per share impact calculated in step four sixth calculate your diluted eps with interim subtotals and then finally show the presentation Again, non-cumulative preferred share dividends are deducted in the earnings calculation only if a dividend is declared. Cumulative preferred share dividends are always deducted in earnings calculations regardless of whether or not a dividend is declared. That's important, but do not include dividends in arrears, current year only. The individual impacts of convertible preferred shares and bonds must be adjusted for any stock splits or dividends. We didn't do that in this example, but if there are stock splits or stock dividends, then the items must be adjusted. If there are any conversions that take place during the year, then those are assumed to have taken place at the beginning of the year. So for example, if you have convertible bonds or preferred shares, and let's say that they're actually converted during the year on April 1st, for example, then the earnings and the share impacts are prorated by 9 out of 12 months. Any individual impacts that are greater than the EPS are anti-dilutive and therefore would be excluded. But in our example, remember one of the ones we had was the $1.50 impact. That was less than $1.72, so that's dilutive and we would include it. If this number were, say, $1.80, it would be greater than the diluted EPS and we would therefore exclude it. Next, warrants, options, or rights, the share impacts for those, must be assessed using the treasury stock method, and that's where any money received from the exercise, the entire amount, is assumed to be used to repurchase shares at an average issue price, so you end up with a net amount diluted. When it comes to ranking, any warrants, rights, or options that are not in the money, so that's when the exercise price is greater than the average market price, they're anti-dilutive, and we forget them. If the warrants, options, or rights are in the money and we have convertible non-cumulative preferred shares where dividends are not declared, they're always tied for number one in the ranking. Any remaining items then are ranked from lowest to highest per share. Now, you may think, well, you know, what's the use of ranking? It's very important because it's necessary to ensure the correct order of entry and diluted EPS calculations. And when we do the subtotals, it helps us identify if any potentially dilutive items become anti-dilutive. Then when we go about calculating our EPS, we always begin with the basic EPS. Then we look to include the dilutive warrants, options, rights, or convertible non-cumulative preferred shares with no dividend. Uh, it doesn't matter the order that they go in. They're all added in at the same time to result in one total increase in shares with no earnings. Then we would calculate a subtotal. Very important. Recalculate the dilutive EPS up to that point. Then compare the next ranked potentially dilutive share impact to the subtotal. If dilutive, we continue to calculate the subtotals and compare the subsequently ranked items. We then stop if an item becomes anti-dilutive or if all potentially dilutive items are included. Now, if we end up stopping in the next ranked item, all items ranked after will automatically be anti-dilutive. There's no point in including them or keep going at that point. Finally, when it comes to presentation, we must show basic undiluted EPS on an IFRS income statement. In fact, all this is really applicable to IFRS. If we have discontinued operations, then the disclosure must show the basic and diluted EPS on earnings from continuing operations, discontinued operations, and net income. So that concludes tutorial 18 on diluted earnings per share. We hope you found this one helpful.